Um, good evening. So this evening I'm going to talk about neonatal health. In Thomas Gresham's day, some things were clearly better than uh, they are today. Uh, if I was a new mother, I'd certainly want the opportunity in mother care or an MS to be able to go and get these kind of maternity clothes and uh, clothes for my children, uh, for example. But many things clearly do improve, and one of the things that has improved most is uh, child health, uh, infant health, and neonatal health. Now, I'm just going to use those terms several times through the talk, so just to define them. A neonatal uh, death is one occurring in the first 28 days, and an infant death is one occurring in the first year. Um, when we look over the last uh, few years, the last 15 years, really, the situation for child health in the world has massively improved. And I'm going to start off with four slides from my first introductory talk so you can see how this fits in to the sequence of the talks I'm giving. Because the theme of this lecture series uh, is that uh, the, because we're improving things so rapidly in child health and in adult health, including people who in the past would have been considered to be elderly, health problems are increasingly being squeezed to the extremes of life, right down to the first 28 days and then not again right up until people are very old indeed by historical standards. So the first four um, uh, slides I'd just like to show, first of all, to make the point that, the, that in every continent in the world, at the moment, child health is improving substantially year on year. To quote The Economist uh, from this headline, Africa is experiencing some of the biggest falls in child mortality ever seen anywhere. And this is true also uh, in Latin America, Asia, and indeed uh, in Europe and North America. This is also true in Asia. And these are just some of the large Asian countries where they were in 1960 uh, and where they've got to today. And the line at the very bottom, the gold line you can see uh, on the graph, uh, is the United States. And as you can see, these, these countries, these major Asian countries, are converging very rapidly in terms of their uh, child health uh, on the, uh, the, the USA. Clearly, they're not there yet. What this has meant, however, uh, and this is a glass half full or a glass half empty, is that as we have improved things in child health, neonatal health has become an increasing proportion of the child's health burden. And that is because our improvements in neonatal health in the first 28 days have advanced at a far slower rate than they have in the rest of child health. So here is Africa, uh, a recent study. And the key thing I want you to look at is the bits which are highlighted in yellow. This is the neonatal health fraction, the proportion of child deaths that occur in the first 28 days. And even at the time of this study, and actually it's probably advanced even further in the last two or three years, uh, around a third of all deaths in children in Africa got to the point now where in the first 28 days of life. If we move to Asia, where child health has advanced further, although Africa is catching up, we're now in a situation where over half of all the deaths in children will occur in the first 28 days. This is an astonishing change by historical standards. Now, the point of this talk... Uh, is going to be to say that this does not need to be the case. The great majority of these neonatal deaths are entirely preventable with existing things which are cheap, effective, and evidence-based. And I'll come on to a whole series of these uh, as the talk goes on. But when we look at uh, the neonatal mortality rates per 1,000 life births, so if you like percentages, just divide these by 10, uh, this is just a few countries, ranging from some of the worst in the world, Angola, 46 uh, per 1,000, uh, per, per uh, right down to Japan and Finland, around about one. I've chosen for this UNICEF data, I've only chosen it because it's a way of actually comparing different countries with a similar methodology. There are various ways of calculating it for the people who uh, get excited by uh, particular methodologies. I'd like, though, to just point out a few things with these data, the first of which is that even Angola, at the bottom of this list, has a much better neonatal mortality than the UK had in Thomas Gresham's day. So things are definitely improving uh, everywhere. 
But the second thing, and the thing which I'm going to concentrate on mainly through this lecture, is the difference between the bottom of this list and the top is 40 times. And almost all of these uh, ones down here could have been prevented using existing methodologies that we all know about. Now, this is the, uh, a cartogram of the global burden of neonatal deaths. And as you can see, unsurprisingly, because you've got countries with very large populations and relatively high neonatal mortality, the big burdens are particularly in Africa and South Asia. So the, the first uh, just over two-thirds of my talk is going to concentrate on things we can do to get this burden down. At the end of the talk, I'm going to talk about the, the United Kingdom as an example of a high-income country and some of the challenges and advances we can look forward to. If we look at the different regions, what we find is every single region, what we have is two bars. The bar on the left is the improvement. I want to stress that, improvement in neonatal health. And the bar on the right is the improvement in child health. And the two things you can take away from this are stunning improvements in child health in virtually every continent and substantial but slower improvements in neonatal health everywhere. So I don't want, although I'm going to say a lot more could be done, I don't want people to go away with the idea that neonatal health is a disaster. It is not. It is improving. It is just improving relatively slowly. This is a map looking at the change in the neonatal mortality rate. And on this map, dark is bad. And there are some countries uh, which you might be surprised by, both in terms of countries which are doing incredibly well. So it, that's starting from very different places, uh, China, Brazil, and the Scandinavian countries, and also some countries which you might find surprised at how, how slow the progress has been, like the United States and Canada. The final really general point I wanted to make before I come on to specifics is to look at uh, the, the risk in terms of those 28 days. And actually, if you look at it, your birthday is by far your most dangerous day unless you choose to take part in a very major war. Uh, this is an incredibly dangerous time. It's no doubt, isn't, there's, no, you know, there's good reasons why people celebrate birthdays. Um, and even if you look uh, at um, the first week, what you find is three quarters of those neonatal deaths actually occur in the first week. The good news, of course, is this can be improved. And this is the United States and England and Wales uh, tracked over, uh, over a period through the last century. And as you can see, and I'm going to come on to the, this century uh, in the last part of this, but there really has been, with a little bit of a hump in the middle, a steady downward trajectory over time. And this is what we should be able to achieve in virtually every country in the world. In fact, in every country in the world. Now, it's often popularly imagined that the big advances in neonatal health are going to be very high tech. There is a kind of uh, idea that neonatal health is high-tech health. And there certainly have been, and are continue to be, and will be, extraordinary advances at the cutting edge. And some of these are being highlighted by some of the uh, talks which the Gresham professor is giving at the moment. Really fantastic talks. In fact, I've stolen this photo from him. Uh, operations in the uterus, congenital, um, con uh, congenital heart disease, genotyping, a whole series of things are massively advancing. But these are advancing incrementally at the really leading edge, at the very, very, the very, very, level, very, very low levels of mortality already. The great majority of the changes which we can achieve are simple, cheap, available, and proven. And I'm going to run through a whole series of them so you can see how we can make an enormous difference with multiple small advances. Because we can actually uh, intervene in this neonatal mortality at multiple points. If you do it with just one, you're not going to achieve it. But if you do it in many places, you can achieve very major improvements. These include before conception. So this is before a mother actually knows she's pregnant. Antenatal care. Premature babies, which I'll come on to quite a bit because they're going to be an increasing proportion, already a very high proportion in uh, more developed countries. At birth and the resuscitation straight afterwards. And postnatal care. Substantial improvements can be made in each one of these areas. And the result is, and this is true for almost everything I'll be discussing both in this session and in the next year's session when I'm looking more at the other end of the age spectrum, many, many small improvements lead to very substantial uh, advances. Let's start off um, with the uh, preconception issues. 
The first thing we can do is improve and make available contraception so that mothers can choose to space their births. This is an extremely effective thing for multiple things. It helps, obviously, families to uh, regulate the size of the family. Uh, but it also is very good for the mother's health. But for the purposes of this talk, it's also extremely good for the baby's health. Short interpregnancy intervals uh, mean bad outcomes in broad terms. Maternal anemia, which is bad if the, if the mother, for when the mother delivers. Uterine rupture, which is very dangerous, can lead to significant increases in neonatal mortality. Uh, stillbirths, which I won't be talking about so much during this talk, it's, but, uh, but also a major issue, uh, but above all, prematurity. And you also end up uh, sometimes uh, with small for dates babies. So there are many reasons why making contraception available so mothers can choose is good for their subsequent babies. The second thing that can be done beforehand uh, is to give folic acid. Very cheap, easy intervention. You can give it two different ways. You can either give it as pills or, or, or you can give it as fortifying, uh, fortifying foods like staple diets. The reason that's important is that probably the, the biggest avoidable cause of uh, congenital disease, which then leads to people having neonatal deaths, is folate deficiency. And you can substantially, uh, and the folate deficiency leads to extremely concerning the congenital malformations, ranging from the extreme end, which is called anencephaly. Uh, this is a, uh, ninth, an, a, a, an 1839 uh, illustration. I really thought it wasn't appropriate and also it was pretty sickening to show the photos. It's a really appalling situation. Uh, all of those will die. Through to spina bifida, which many people will have heard of. Uh, there's, a, there's a range, but all of these are associated with folate deficiency. And you can easily, by giving folate to people who are likely to become pregnant, uh, reduce uh, it as what's called primary prevention by giving it to everybody by between 46 and 62 uh, percent the rates of this. And you can reduce the secondary prevention, so if someone's had it once the second time round, by 70 percent. Incredibly easy to do, cheap and easy. And in low income countries, 29 percent of neonatal deaths are due to congenital causes, are caused by uh, this cause. And folic acid probably reduced uh, deaths by 13%. Just one intervention. The next one, and this is one where we have had significant advances, is on neonatal tetanus. Tetanus, for anybody who's seen it, is the worst disease in the world to die of, apart from rabies. It is incredibly painful, uh, and it is incredibly common. It's a terrible disease. It is also a, an almost completely preventable disease. Yet neonatal tetanus killed very large numbers of people and still continues to in many parts of the world. Uh, in, in the extremes, for example, in the Maasai uh, culture, when uh, before recent changes, when people tended to use cow dung to actually uh, put around the cord, uh, Tetanus uh, was, could, could cause uh, deaths, could, you get neonatal tetanus in 80 per thousand uh, live births. Quite very, very high rates indeed. Not a single one of those should have occurred. So simply by vaccinating twice every person who could be a mother so that she can pass on her protection and having clean birthing using very simple techniques, you can comp almost completely prevent neonatal tetanus. Here's uh, an example from Egypt. Uh, Egypt's done very well in this area. Uh, this is the rates of neonatal tetanus, the cases of neonatal tetanus, uh, under routine situations. They then did an intensified kind of vaccination program, and then they actually started taking a high-risk approach where they identified women who were at high risk of having tetanus, and they got, over a period uh, of uh, just over 20 years, tetanus rates almost down to zero. And if you look, actually, at tetanus rates around the world, uh, 35 countries have eliminated neonatal tetanus, what, which used to be one of the major killers of uh, neonates uh, since 2000. Again, again, an astonishing achievement. Syphilis. And I'm going to go through three infections which occur uh, during pregnancy. Syphilis is the second one. Um, syphilis is an old enemy. Um, I've chosen to illustrate it uh, with things from the UK and the USA because there is a tendency, has always been a tendency, uh, in uh, British and other cultures to blame syphilis on foreigners. Uh, we originally called it the French pox. 
Uh, then when we started to dislike the Spanish more, we called it the Spanish disease. Uh, it is a disease which used to cause uh, very significant problems, and I'll give you the data in the next slide, uh, in the UK. But it is uh, really gone now from a combination of testing and widespread use of antibiotics, except in quite, uh, quite specific groups. But globally, over a million, uh, almost a million and a half, pregnant women have syphilis, and 80% of these attend antenatal care, and yet nothing uh, much is done about it uh, in, as a result. And as a result of that, around half a million uh, maternal uh, out, bad outcomes occur, including a very high number of stillbirths, neonatal deaths, and preterm or low birth weight children. So syphilis is a, is a disease which is very easy to, to test for. The test has been available for many years and is incredibly easy to treat with penicillin or a whole range of other antibiotics. This, again, should be wholly preventable. Just to go on to the UK figures, looking back almost exactly 100 years, here's what the Royal Commission on Venereal Disease said, uh, and these data were probably accurate. The number of UK persons infected with syphilis cannot fall below 10% in the large cities. Very, very high numbers indeed. Uh, as a result of penicillin and testing, this has essentially disappeared as a maternal problem in the UK. And the, mater the maternal uh, syphilis rates now are really quite highly concentrated. All of these could be got rid of, relatively straightforward. Again, simple testing and treatment. Now, Syphilis is an opportunity just to illustrate what actually happens with all of these kinds of interventions. This is the inverted pyramid care, and we're taking, I'm taking neonatal syphilis just as an example. You start off with a large group of pregnant women with syphilis, an entirely treatable disease. A smaller proportion of them access antenatal care. A smaller proportion of those do so early. Of those, only a small proportion have a syphilis test. Some of them aren't given the result. Those who have the test uh, receive treatment, but only in a minority of those. And then some of those won't receive the right treatment. And you end up with a, quite a significant group of people, who, who, this large group, who have syphilis at the time their child is born. This is what happens with almost all the antenatal things we could do and the postnatal things we could do, is this falling off at multiple different levels of delivery. And the final infection I wanted to talk about was malaria and pregnancy. Uh, malaria is something which Professor Cox is a world expert on, uh, among many other things. Um, the thing about malaria and pregnancy is we all think of malaria as a disease which causes fever, headache, and makes people very unwell, and sometimes people die of cerebral malaria. This is the model that most people have in their mind. The other group that they think of is the uh, elderly Indian colonels having their gin and tonic to ward off the malaria they think they caught 40 years uh, ago, or at least that's their story. Uh, the kind of malaria I'm talking about is in women who have repeatedly been infected in, uh, through their lives in high transmission areas, they are actually almost completely immune, not completely immune, but almost completely immune to getting severe malaria. But there's one bit of them that is not, and that is their placenta. So the malaria then latches on to the placenta of pregnant women in very high line numbers, and it leads to a number of problems, including very small babies and maternal anemia. Again, malaria is easy to deal with in pregnancy. Two things you need to do, give pregnant women uh, bed nets, treated bed nets to stop them getting bitten and give them a preventive treatment from time to time in their pregnancy. So there we've got three infections, tetanus, syphilis and malaria. If you just dealt with those systematically, the impact on neonatal mortality would immediately, before I come on to any of the other things, be substantial. Moving on to the next uh, stage, prematurity. So prematurity, which I'm going to take for the sake of argument as less than 36 weeks, gestation 40 being uh, the sort of typical uh, median normal, normal term. Around 27% of all neonatal deaths are in premature uh, children. Now prematurity is the dominant cause of neonatal mortality in high-income countries. It's the major cause. In low-income countries, there's a smaller proportion, but that's because everything else is worse. Prematurity is still a much higher problem in uh, poorer countries than it is in richer countries. So around 1.5 per thousand births in Europe and around 10 per thousand births in Africa, for example. When people think about neonatal care uh, and prematurity, they often think, and reasonably, of the very high intensity end. This is, the, uh, this is St Thomas's Hospital, just across the river. 
And there certainly is a huge amount that can be done at the high intensity, high tech end of, uh, of neonatal care. The kind of thing that was, was parodied is the machine that goes ping uh, by the Monty Python team. However, actually the greatest improvements you can make do not rely on very high tech uh, machinery. And the first of these is steroids. If you give a woman who is uh, going into premature labor steroids, you significantly reduce, you reduce the mortality by around 30%. And in middle income countries, you actually reduce it even more than that. And yet the coverage in most of the places where most of the deaths occur is around 10%. If we could give almost all of those neonatal uh, ladies, so the, the, those ladies having, uh, having early um, uh, pregnancies, sorry, early deliveries uh, in prematurity uh, steroids, you could significantly reduce uh, the mortality, even in low-income settings. Another useful drug in this setting uh, is magnesium sulfate, which many of you will know as Epsom salts. Epsom salts have been marketed for a very large number of problems, including your liver, your gut, uh, if, you had, if I had hair, making your hair wavy, uh, they're, they're, they're used in a very wide range of situations, but they also have a number of very important uh, poss possible uses in pregnancy. Two in particular are important. The first of which, uh, which is, uh, in, is, is, is relevant but in tangentially to this, is presented preventing seizures in women who've got eclampsia. Eclampsia is high blood pressure and protein in pregnant women, a very, very dangerous condition for them as well as their neonates. But the other thing which it can be useful for is if you give people who are premature Epsom salts, if you give them magnesium sulfate uh, uh, just before the birth, you significantly reduce the risk of, cere of cerebral palsy. So you can both reduce mortality with things like steroids, but you can also reduce the risks of prematurity, in particular the neurological ones. But the biggest improvement recently that has been in prematurity is much, much simpler than that. It's called kangaroo care. And this is something which is actually was developed in the developing world and is now being moved back into the developed world. It's an example, a relatively rare example in neonatal health of, of reverse uh, technology transfer. The problem for, uh, the biggest problem for prematurity is that, uh, that the neonate very quickly gets hypothermic. And I mean very quickly, gets hypothermic. Its, blood, its temperature drops extremely rapidly. And there is a very simple way of keeping that neonate's temperature at the same temperature as it should be, and that's to put it inside the clothes next to mum, or indeed next to dad. This very simple intervention reduces mortality in premature children by 50%. Astonishing, really, when you think about it. And it also, for those who are worried that this is leading to uh, a reduction in mortality, but actually people, the children are being born and are going to survive, are going to be uh, very malformed and things, it actually also leads to reduction in uh, serious morbidity as well. Now, you might think, well, that's obvious. That's such a natural thing to do. Let me disabuse you of that. Just this is the image of the newborn with the mother that permeates virtually every society. And I... Uh, only the Greek monks and the one woman artist on this particular group have actually even put any clothes on the baby. Uh, normally it's the baby who's got no clothes and it's the mum who's fully clothed. Uh, this, so actually it is not the normal practice in most societies to put uh, children, ba new babies skin to skin. It's normal practice to wrap them up and that is the reason why this can be such a life-transforming life, uh, life in, um, uh, intervention. Moving on to... Um, normal deliveries, although this is true also for premature babies, the next thing you can do is improve cord care. So the cord is the bit which attaches the baby through the placenta to mum. And cutting it uh, and clamping it is a key part of birthing in every society. The first thing you can do is make sure that the, this is clean, that if people are going to cut a cord, they do so with a clean razor or a clean pair of scissors or something like that. That single intervention reduces infection in both the child, the mother, and reduces tetanus. The second thing you can do is to use a simple chlorhexidine, which is an antiseptic that all of you will have seen advertised for gum disease. If you use that on the cord in normal birthing, which people have tried this, you get a reduction of 23% uh, in uh, neonatal mortality. Again, astonishing improvements. 
Uh, and there may be some advantages also to one other improvement, which is slightly to delay the time between the baby coming out and clamping the cord. That's a bit more controversial. Now, those of you who are mathematicians will be starting to look at these numbers and saying, well, you're getting a 50% reduction here and a 23% reduction here and a 23% reduction here. Well, this is, surely this is more than 100%. I just want to be clear about this. Of course, what happens is you get your first reduction and then it's 23% on that reduction. It's the reason I've tried not to use too many whole numbers, actually, because these are all additive to one another. But if you put them together, you are getting very, very substantial improvements. And that's before you get on to things like cesarean section, arguably one of the earliest uh, major still used operations, uh, still the commonest uh, operation probably in Africa, for example. I want to make just two points about these things. They're the first of which is, under certain circumstances, these are baby-saving and they are very often mother-saving. But I've illustrated it, in fact, with an Arabic uh, uh, example where the mother sadly had died. The baby was being born and was born subsequently alive. So it has been using that for, for centuries. But it is very important to understand that it's not just cutting the, cutting the mother open, it's also the anaesthetic. So uh, very big studies of this have demonstrated substantial reductions in, more, in, in, uh, in survival of the neonate if, for example, you use general anaesthetic rather than spinal anaesthetic. So there are things you can do to improve this in medium in, uh, intensity medical settings. And then we've got helping newborns breathe. Of the 136 million child babies who are born, around 10 million require assistance to breathe when they come out. If you don't get that right, you then get what used to be termed birth asphyxia. It's now, it's now being taught called interpartum-related events, which are, I think is not quite as elegant a name. Fortunately, the simplest thing you can do to help babies breathe is stimulate them, and rubbing them, uh, rubbing them down is quite enough to achieve that. And what you then get is you have these 10 million for which simple stimulation is probably enough, you then move up to around 6 million babies who are going to need basic resuscitation. That's a bag and a mask with training that any of you who've done a first aid course with the St John's Ambulance Brigade uh, could do. This is not difficult uh, things to do. And there's only really a very small proportion, less than 1%, who need the kind of advanced resuscitation that people like the neonatal uh, St Thomas's unit I showed you at the beginning uh, can offer. So simple neonatal resuscitation, again, uh, training in this would probably reduce uh, this con condition, um, uh, birth asphyxia, or it's under its modern name, uh, by around 30%. And there are a variety of situations where you could do it in certain, if you do it in the community, you get a certain percentage, if you do it in the hospital, you get a certain percentage. But additively, the improvements in this basic resuscitation would be substantial. And this is all the kit you need. This, incidentally, for those who've not had a baby, is not a real baby. This is a training, uh, training baby, uh, but it does the job in terms of actually teaching people how to do things. And finally, in terms of these simple things, treatment of infections. This is in the neonates in their first 28 days. Neonatal pneumonia is extremely common when they get an infection of the lungs, uh, and meningitis is certainly not rare. Very large trials demonstrate you get a 25% reduction by just treating adequately with oral antibiotics the, um, the pneumonias you get. So you just have to diagnose them and you can straight away uh, save those babies' lives. And around 40% uh, for the pneumonia-specific mortality. And if you can do injectable antibiotics, it's a marginally greater level of skill needed. It's even greater than that. So the only difficulty here is getting the diagnosis. And again, just to stress, this is not just about mortality, it's also about child development. So you're, you're not only saving babies, but even of those who you uh, save, you're significantly reducing the risks of them going on to have further health problems. Finally, in terms of, uh, just to round this off, I've given a long list of things that we should be doing, all of which are cheap, simple, highly effective, and highly evidence-based. For those of you who are in the medical profession, almost all the data I've quoted are from large, well-conducted meta-analyses. This is grade A1 evidence that I've been quoting here. But there are, of course, a lot of very useless things that are done in childbirth, have always been done in childbirth, and in many places still are done in childbirth. I've got a long list of them, which I'm not going to read out here. I will just, set, I will just, I, I will just particularly uh, um, pick out two. Routine separation from mother and 
application of substances to the court. But there are many others that people are still doing, including in the UK, uh, which are either useless or dangerous. So there are things we need to do, and there are things we, stop, we need to stop doing. So these simple interventions combined would significantly reduce both neonatal mortality and morbidity. Just do this package, contraception, folic acid, stop smoking, which I'll come on to, tetanus immunisation, syphilis test and treat, malaria prevention, magnesium sulphate, steroids in prematurity, kangaroo care in prematurity, cord care, better anaesthetics, better resuscitation and treatment of infection. Only one of these, really, cesarean section and the anaesthetics actually needs doctors. The rest can be done in almost any setting. Do this combined package, and the reason I read out the whole lot is do all of those things, and the neonatal rates in most of the developing world would shoot almost immediately down very close to where we got them in the UK. So why are we not doing better? The evidence is good. The policy is generally sensible. If you read the, uh, the policy around this in most African countries, it, it's exactly what I've just said. But changing practice and health systems strengthening is difficult and slow. What I've got here is a photo, actually, of my grandmother who was sent out to set up the obstetric service in Ghana with the first midwives she trained in the 1930s. I'm sad to say that these ladies would very much recognise that many of the things currently being done in Africa, Asia, and Latin America are the things they were trying to stop being done in the 1930s, the best part of 100 years later. And the, really, the, the, few, the, the key things here are Changing medical practice and traditional practice, and birthing is a very traditional event. It's the oldest traditional event because we've all, that's the only thing we've all got in common until we die. Um, it, that is slow and difficult. The medical profession is a slow and uh, conservative profession as a member of it. The second technical thing is spotting high-risk births. This is the only really technically difficult thing of all the things I've talked about, working out who may go into labour. But it's not as difficult, I think, as you might imagine. Funding clearly always a barrier. And there's very clear evidence if you start giving doctors and nurses incentives to do better, they do do better. So it's not that they don't know how to. This is a big study done uh, in Latin America. Now I'm moving on to the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, it's really very striking. These are all the deaths in the UK in people under the age of 20. 60% of them are in children in their first 28 days. 60%. So this is a really important area for us as a country to concentrate on. Now, clearly, it's not. Um, <coughs> it's uh, clearly been a lot worse than that in the past. Um, this is around the time that Gresham College was, fought, was actually founded. And I wanted to show you two different things. This is infant mortality. The first of which is uh, these are infant mortalities, and clearly the data from these days are we have to interpret carefully. Um, but what we're seeing is in London at that stage around 200 to 250 uh, deaths in children, uh, infants, uh, before, uh, uh, in their first year. It then goes up as Britain urbanises, but not in the rural areas. So there's always in the UK been a very substantial difference between urban and rural areas. And what's actually interesting to me as, an ex as a current physician uh, is that the urban, uh, the rural areas of um, Britain had similar mortalities to rural areas of Africa and Asia now. Urban areas were always a lot worse. But standing improvements from really about 1800 onwards, as incrementally we start to bring in some of the kinds of things I've talked about and others. In the last 20 years, this downward trend has, I'm glad to say, continued. So the infant mortality rate now, uh, this is the latest ONS data, are 3.8 per thousand live births. The rate in and, uh, 1983, so 20 years later, was 10. So that's a 62% reduction just in two decades. Very impressive, I think. But if you compare the mortality in neonatal mortality rate, which halved, the post-neonatal mortality rate fell a lot faster. So again, you're getting this concentration of the problem in the very first few days. These are data from the USA. This is CDC. And the reason I've chosen American data is because these are all the OECD countries. These are the richest countries. Uh, and the USA does worst. So I wanted to make sure it was US data I quoted. So no one uh, who watches this online quotes, it accuses us of using European data. The United Kingdom is in the middle of the pack, I would say. The United Kingdom has a, a rate, in, uh, according to CDC, of around 4.2 for infant mortality compared to about half that 
uh, in, for example, Finland or Japan. And there are a variety of reasons for that, uh, which I could go into in questions and answers. But the more important thing, I think, is that the neonatal mortality rate has fallen very rapidly initially and still is falling uh, since the 1970s in all of the constituent countries of uh, this country. What are the things that we can actually do about this? Well, uh, the biggest risk factor uh, overall uh, in the UK is prematurity. Around two-thirds of those infant deaths in the UK are in babies who are less than 37 weeks at the time they're born. So this is the big group probably to concentrate on. And there are some things which are difficult to do something about. They're particularly likely, for example, if the mother is very young or is very old. The biggest thing we can probably do something about is smoking in pregnancy. There is now really clear evidence, not only that smoking is associated with bad things, but when the smoking bans came in, prematurity rates dropped and dropped significantly. So smoke, reducing smoking in pregnancy to zero, including passive smoking, would have a very major impact here in the UK. And, of course, it occurs particularly, as with most diseases, in the maturely disadvantaged. So this is the, uh, these are the socioeconomic groups in the UK. Uh, and then, essentially, the lower your socioeconomic group in terms of uh, where you're placed in the standard rankings, the higher the chance that your infant and then your baby uh, is going to die. That's true in every country. Always has been. But it's not completely simple. This is London. Dark countries are the highest, dark, dark colours are the highest mortality rates, and light, light coloured colours are the lowest ones. And for those of you who know London, what you'll see is that there are some outliers. There are some bits of the city which are actually doing better than you'd expect, given where they are in the socioeconomic advantage scale, and there are bits that are doing less well. So this is, it's not just about, uh, well, of course, poorer people have more, worse outcomes. There are certainly some particular areas we need to concentrate on. This is around multiple births. The, multiple, the neonatal mortality rate here in the UK for multiple births is almost six times higher than for people who have one child. That's a very big difference. This is clearly a group we need to concentrate very heavily on. Uh, and there are a variety of reasons for that. But one of them is that actually uh, children who are born in, as twins or, or, or more uh, tend to be very low birth weight. And there's a much higher uh, proportion of them will go on to have prematurity. Some risk factors are going to increase. Now, obesity in the UK is clearly not a new problem. This is an old uh, seaside card uh, I've dug out. Uh, but it is definitely going up. Uh, and it has been very strongly associated uh, with eclampsia, diabetes, and therefore indirectly with prematurity. So we can anticipate that this, this, this problem is going pro probably to get worse. There are also a group of women who previously either did not have children, did not survive, or were at least encouraged not to have children, particularly people with, for example, themselves who had congenital heart disease, who are now doing so. So there are some women, which is a very good thing, who are now going into having babies who are much higher risk than they were. So these are things which will increase over time. And this is not necessarily a bad thing, on the second thing. That's not a bad thing at all. There are now uh, a number of potential advances which are uh, going to significantly change the nature of a neonatal care in the UK over the next few decades, as in other developed countries. And I'm going to talk uh, in a bit more detail about several of these because I think they're important. The first of them is non-invasive prenatal testing. One of the big risks has been that if you wanted to test whether your child, for example, might have Down syndrome, the tests we've had to date have actually had a significant risk to the pregnancy because they've involved actually sampling uh, the placenta of the mother. We are increasingly moving into an era where we can actually diagnose a large number of genetic uh, situations for uh, babies who are in the, in the womb uh, non-invasively, just by doing a blood test. No risk to the baby or the mother. Now, this raises a lot of ethical questions. It raises a lot of practical questions. And it means that a lot of things will be detected which currently are not being detected. But it does mean that actually one of the major risks uh, of interventional procedures in neonatal care is actually going to decrease. So that's the first uh, thing which I think predict, predict is going to make quite a significant difference over the next, uh, the next uh, decade. The second is an explosion in near patient testing. So there are now dipsticks to test for very large numbers of things which previously required laboratory support. Uh, starting off in infectious diseases but in quite a lot of other areas as well. 
So this is going to make it a lot easier for a GP or for others, uh, even for people to test themselves, for things in pregnancy. And again, we haven't really thought through how is this task shifting going to work. The third thing which is going to uh, significantly, uh, is likely to change, uh, I'm, I'm assured by people in this area, is risk stratification. So it's not demedicalizing, taking doctors and even midwives out of very low risk pregnancies wherever possible and concentrating efforts on those people who are high, at highest risk. So these, I think, are all trends that most people uh, think are going to happen over the next uh, few years. The big one, I think, which we need to concentrate on, uh, however, um, is uh, drug companies and their risk profile for pregnancy. Most drug companies avoid, since thalidomide in particular, some other ones as well, have avoided testing drugs in pregnancy. It seems to be an extremely high risk uh, thing to do. And you know, the numerical backing up for that statement, here is a nice study looking at the drug pipeline done by Fisk and Atten, uh, very recently. And what it demonstrates is 660 drugs in cardiovascular disease. I'm delighted by that. My next talk will be about uh, talking about keeping hearts young in our ageing bodies. But compare that to 17 drugs in any stage of development for obstetrics. The drugs that I was talking about for use in, in, in pregnancy were steroids and Epsom salts. These are hardly cutting edge uh, of the pharmaceutical profession. So encouraging the pharmaceutical industry to actually uh, start to do more drugs in pregnancy will, I think, be essential if we want to try and uh, capitalise on the, advance, the advantages that better testing both of the genetics and also uh, of the mother uh, are potentially offering us over the next few years. Uh, this, I think, is something which as policymakers and uh, drug companies together need to take a pretty serious look at, given this, the, the fact that so much risk now is going to be concentrated in this first 28 days. So in this talk, I've really laid out the fact that over the, um, the last few years, uh, the stunning improvements in child mortality in Africa, Asia, Latin America, Europe and North America have not been kept uh, up with by uh, improvements in natal mortality. Things have got better, but at a much slower rate. The result is that increasingly, uh, the biggest risk to anybody who is under the age of 80 is going to be in their first 28 days. We must do something about this. And uh, I think what I hope I've laid out to you is that by just using a whole series of really quite simple interventions, with the exception of cesarean section anaesthetics, all of them could be done by all of you with minimal training. So, you know, you could all basically solve this problem if you could clone yourselves and uh, be at the birthing place at the right time with just a few drugs. Um, we could make substantial improvements uh, in this. And uh, once achieved, that is likely to be largely irreversible. So this, you know, just as the, uh, we have risen, in my view, as a generation to the challenge of improving child mortality, I think anybody who looks at these numbers would, I think, say, both overseas but also here in the UK, uh, we need to look seriously at this first 28 days and aim uh, to make the same kinds of advances uh, in this critical period. It's very concentrated. We know where the babies are because they're in pregnant women who is pretty easy to spot. Uh, we should do something about it, and I think it's a great opportunity for us to do so. Thank you very much.